Today's Bible reading is John 12, 1 to 11. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honour. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Sally. Well, good morning, everybody. It's lovely to be with you this morning and a privilege to um, open up this fantastic gospel account from John's gospel. It's so rich, and I have to begin by telling you that I don't think I'm coming this morning with many answers. I'm probably going to come with more questions than answers because as I've read it over this last week, it has raised huge questions for me as well. So let's see how we go. Let's pray briefly. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for this wonderful gospel account. And I pray that it would speak to each one of us, to our hearts and our minds, and that we would be changed through it more into the image of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay, well, before we get going into the passage, if we could have the um, slide up. Oh, it is up. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. Before we get going to the passage, we need to have some context. It's really important for this passage. And so I want to just bring you a bit of context about the geography and the timing. Here's a map of central Israel uh, in Jesus' day uh, with some of the sort of key landmarks for this, for this passage. <clears throat> the background is Jesus had grown up in Nazareth, Nazareth up in the north, um, and uh, for, the, for the first 30 years of his life. Um, you can see the Sea of Galilee in the north, the Dead Sea in the south, joined by the Jordan River. And when Jesus began his ministry at the age of 30, he began it in the synagogue in Nazareth where he was kicked out and the crowd tried to throw him off a cliff. And so he hastily moved away from Nazareth to, um, uh, to the area around the Sea of Galilee. And he based himself in Capernaum, probably boarding in Peter's household. Um, Peter, John, and James had a fishing business on the Sea of Galilee. And, uh, and Jesus, um, for the next two years, spent most of his time in the towns and villages around the Galilee area. But later on in his ministry, he moved south. Now, during the time he was in Galilee, he would have gone to Jerusalem and back for some of the major festivals. But he was largely up north for the first two years. But he came south in his final year of ministry. And he would have traveled down the dotted line you see close to the Jordan River there. That's the Jordan Valley. And, um, and he would have come to Jericho. In fact, we read about when he healed a blind man um, on the, on, as he was leaving Jericho. And then from Jericho, he would have traveled up, uh, up the, the road to Jerusalem. It's it's only about 15 miles from Jericho to Jerusalem, and the road climbs 4,000 feet, uh, which is extraordinary. But the reason is that the Dead Sea is the lowest place on earth. It's 1,500 feet below sea level. Jerusalem is 2,500 feet above sea level. And so there's about a 4,000 foot, um, uh, 4, foot difference. And so it was a very steep climb from Jericho up to Jerusalem. And just before you get to Jerusalem was Bethany. Bethany is where this gospel account happened. Bethany is where Jesus had, there was a dinner in Jesus' honor at the house of Martha and Mary and their brother Lazarus. Now, just to give you a, a quick uh, idea, next slide, please, um, 
Eric, thank you. Now, this is a photograph, modern-day photograph, taken from the center of Jerusalem, the photographers in the center of Jerusalem, and looking out across the Kidron Valley towards the Mount of Olives. Um, you can see the Al-Aqsa Mosque in the, in, in the foreground. And on the Mount of Olives, just to the left of the golden dome of the Al-Aqsa Mosque, would, is the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus spent some of his last hours with his disciples. You can go there. It's wonderful. I've been there. Uh, fantastic place. And um, anyway, if you go look at the skyline on the top of the Mount of Olives, you'll see a tall spire. Now, that's not Bethany. But if you look just to the right, uh, a little bit to the right, stay on the skyline, you'll see a smaller spire that's sort of set back a bit more distant. That's Bethany. Okay, so you can see how the proximity of Bethany, where this dinner took place, to Jerusalem. It's close. It's only two and a half miles away, something like that. Um, it was very close to Jerusalem, and that's important. So if we can go back to the, the map, thank you, Eric. <laughs> okay. So, um, so Jesus is in Bethany. Now, what's happened in the last three months is also really important. Because before this dinner party, Jesus had come down to Jerusalem for the festival of dedication in the winter. So it was three months before. The festival of dedication is also called Hanukkah, and it happens at our Christmas time. And three months, this was three months before the dinner. We know that because in the, in the gospel passage, if you look, it says that it was six days before the Passover. Those are the first words of our gospel passage. Six days before Passover. So three months before, Jesus was in Jerusalem. And, and if you read the earlier account of when he was in Jerusalem, what was he doing? He was seriously upsetting the religious leaders of his day. And they were accusing him of blasphemy. They said he was claiming to be God. In fact, he was certainly at least claiming to be the Son of God. And they tried to stone him, and they tried to arrest him, and they wanted to do away with him. So Jesus, this is, this is really important, Jesus was a wanted man months before this dinner. There was a price on his head. It says that, um, uh, that the, the, um, the Pharisees tried to arrest him, but he escaped their grasp. And he went back across the Jordan to a place where John had been baptizing in the early days. So after this incident in Jerusalem, Jesus travels back down to Jericho and then crosses over the Jordan River to get away from the heat because they're after him. And so he's, he's almost like a man on the run. It's, 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 it, we don't always sort of think about that um, when we read the gospel readings. And then while Jesus is on the east side of the Jordan, he gets word that his friend Lazarus is, is very, very sick and is dying. Martha and Mary have sent word that, that Lazarus, their brother, is dying. Jesus waits two days and then sets off from where he is on the east side of the Jordan and gets to Bethany. By the time he gets to Bethany, Lazarus has been dead for four days in the tomb. And in the very famous gospel account, Jesus calls the dead Lazarus out of the tomb and Lazarus is resurrected to life. And, uh, uh, and it's amazing. And and so many people are in awe of this, that they all start following Jesus. And the religious leaders get even more angry, and they try to, they, want, they plot to kill him again. And so Jesus, it says, uh, just before our, um, our gospel account here, it says, Therefore Jesus no longer moved about publicly among the people of Judea. Instead, he withdrew to a region near the wilderness to a village called Ephraim, where he stayed with his disciples. Do you see where Ephraim is up there? It's to the north west of Jericho. And interestingly enough, it's also, it's not on one of the main roads. It's in the middle of nowhere. It's close to the edge of the wilderness. Jesus really was on the run. He had to hide. He had to get away from all of the population areas because there was a bounty on his head. He was a wanted man. So why then does he come back down from Ephraim to this dinner party at Mary and Martha's? Well, the reason is not because he was because he wanted to come to a dinner party, but his time had come. The Passover was almost there. This was going to be the moment. Jesus knew he was going to go to the cross. Six, seven days after the dinner party, he was nailed to a cross. So he comes down to Bethany. That's the background. And the point is, can you imagine being at that dinner party with Jesus, Martha and Mary and Lazarus and all the disciples with them? Can you imagine... You're sitting with the most wanted man, the man that the authorities are hunting down. They want to kill him. 
And so it's edgy. It's, it's edgy. It would not have been comfortable. As they gathered around that table, it would have been, the tension would have been really high. But what happens in the next few minutes, I think, completely wipes all of that from their memory because what, Martha, what Mary now does puts the tension through the roof. Because it says, here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about half a liter of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Just before we think about that, there's an interesting thing. Some of you will know about the account that happened months before at Mary and Martha's house um, when Jesus attended another meal there. Do you remember Mary and Martha? Where was Martha, anybody? Where was Martha at that? In the kitchen. She was serving, right? Where is she in this account? Serving. She's in the kitchen again, right? Where was Mary in the previous account? At the feet of Jesus. Where is Mary in this account? At the feet of Jesus, isn't she? I mean, they're so rounded, these characters. It's amazing. You know, they, they don't change. We, do, we don't easily change, do we? Anyway, there they are. So it's hard perhaps to grasp quite how outrageous this was. But the first thing Mary does here is that she lets down her hair. Yeah, Jewish women had their hair tied up. They did not let down their hair in public. They did not let their hair down in front of a group of men. That was provocative. It was outrageous. Probably the only time that Jewish women in those days let down their hair was when they were in the bedroom with their husband. And so it was outrageous. She just let down her hair. She had to because she was going to use it to wipe Jesus' feet. So that's the first thing she does. And, and, and Tom Wright, the biblical commentator Tom Wright says, he's trying to find a kind of modern equivalent. He said if you were at a smart dinner party uh, you know, and, and a woman was there you know, wearing a nice dress, it would be a bit like she hitched her dress right up above her thighs and sort of showed a tattoo to you on you know, something like that. It would be, what is she doing? You know, what next? Anyway, so Mary lets down her hair. She takes a very expensive bottle of perfume and just pours it on Jesus' feet. I mean, what a waste. You know, what's she doing? And we discover that this bottle of perfume is worth a year's wages. It's the equivalent of about £25,000 in our sort of money today. It was a pound of pure nard. It wasn't, it wasn't very liquid. It would have been quite gooey. It was, um, it, it, it was the concentrate, if you like, a very expensive perfume. So that, was, that, was, that too was outrageous. And then, she, having poured the perfume on Jesus' feet, she wipes it with her hair. I mean, that's such an intimate thing to do. It's quite a sensual thing to do. It's, it's, they, they would have just looked at that and, and just thought, what on earth is going on? They would have forgotten all about the fact that Jesus was a wanted man. They'd be thinking, I've got a crazy woman in the room. And, uh, and in the end... In the end, Judas cracks. He can't take it anymore. And he says, he says this, Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? And it's a really good question, if you think about it. The value of, of that perfume could have been given to the poor. And it's not a strange suggestion for Judas to make, because Jesus was a traveling rabbi with a group of disciples. And in those days, the traveling rabbi, they, they would have a purse, and rabbis would lead by example in terms of giving generously. So when they came to a village or came to a town, they would take some of the money from their purse and they would give it to the poor. It was, it was part of, of religious devotion, if you like, giving money to the poor. So he's not making an unreasonable suggestion that it should have been sold and given to the poor. Now, we do learn that his motives are mixed because we learn later that, his, uh, that he actually was dipping his hand into the, into the money bag and uh, keeping some of it for himself. However, the disciples didn't know that at this time. And, uh, and so it's a reasonable suggestion. So Jesus then replies with a really strange kind of response. He comes to her defense and he says, leave her alone. He says, it was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. 
Why is that strange? Well, it's strange because Jesus says, leave her alone. It was intended that she should save the perfume for the day of my burial. Well, is this the day of her burial, of his burial? No, it's not. So, so what does he mean? What's going on here? Um, well, Tom Wright, the biblical commentator, offers two alternative suggestions, which I think both work. So briefly, he says one possibility is that Mary kind of knew what was going to happen to Jesus. She, I mean, he, she, everyone knew he was a wanted man. She probably knew it was possible that Jesus would get arrested and executed, and they might never get a chance to anoint his body. So she was doing it in advance as a prophetic act. She was anointing his body as they would do with dead bodies then. That's one possibility. The other possibility that Tom Wright suggests is that um, the, the pound of nard, we, we often think, I think, when we read this story, we often make assumptions. And, and I think we kind of imagine that she just turned the bottle upside down and the whole thing was emptied over Jesus' feet. Well, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say she poured all of the perfume on his feet. She doesn't say that she emptied the bottle. And so, since it was a pound of nard, there's a very good chance that actually what she did was took a brand new, unopened bottle of pound of nard, because it would have been made in pounds, and uncorked it and poured some of it on Jesus' feet. And what Jesus is saying here to Judas is, leave her alone, because this perfume is meant to be saved for the day of my burial. In other words, keep the rest, because it's going to be it's going to be used on me after I'm dead. So we don't know exactly which one he meant, but either way it works. It's a bit technical, but I thought I'd just share that with you. <laughs> so Jesus cuts across this, this incredible tension, and he affirms what Mary is doing. And the question it raises is this. Why, why would it be more important to pour perfume on Jesus' feet than to sell it and give that huge amount of money it was worth to the poor. Why would it be more important? Well, it would only be more important if the death of Jesus was going to be the ultimate act of salvation for the world, a world of poverty, a world of evil, a world of sin, a world of addiction, a world of all of these things. It would only make sense if Jesus' act on the cross was going to be the redemption of the world. And of course, we believe that that's exactly what it was. We believe that he loved us beyond measure, that he, remember seven days later, he will be nailed to a wooden cross and he will die in agony. A perfect, sinless man will die in agony so that you and I can be forgiven and set free to live our lives to the full and to be saved to eternal life, then it makes sense. And so the questions this, this passage raises for me are this. You know, Mary's, Mary's act of pouring the perfume on Jesus' feet was, was love beyond measure. She was lear- she'd, she'd sat at Jesus' feet before and she'd learnt from him. Jesus was going to love beyond measure when he gave his life for us on the cross. But Mary, the greatest act of worship she could make was to give away to give up the most valuable thing that she possessed. That this, this pound of nard may well have been her, her kind of pension, or it might, have been, it might have been waiting for a dowry for when she got married or, or, or something, but it was probably the most valuable thing that she had, and she gave it up in worship of Jesus. And the question it raises to me is, what am I prepared to give up as an act of worship to Jesus? Am I prepared to love beyond measure, to lay myself, my life down and love beyond measure? Are we people whom, whom Jesus would, oh, sorry, are we people whom others would look at and say, they've been with Jesus, they've been with Jesus? These are the questions that it raises for me. And so I've been thinking about it a bit and and, and I thought, what is the equivalent of that perfume for us today in our, in our lives, in our society? And I think it's true to say that in our hugely busy, uh, 
just lives full of one running from one place to another, one thing to another, that the greatest treasure that we have is our time. We're time poor, aren't we, in our society? And so I think, for me, I think Jesus is calling me to give him more of my time. And perhaps he's calling all of us to do that too. I don't know. But there may be other things. There may be other things in your life that you're, he's calling you to give up as, a, as an act of worship to him. So they, these are the questions that I'm left with. What are we prepared to give up as our worship of Jesus? Are we prepared to love beyond measure? And are we people whom others would look at and say, they have been with Jesus? Amen.